Earlier today, the Republican Party adopted its 2024 platform, and it, well, I don't know how else to say it, but it disappointed many pro-life conservatives. I think that's probably a very mild way of saying it, uh, because they abandoned much of the language that the party has followed since the 1980s when it comes to protecting the life of the unborn. But it was not just today's outcome that was disturbing. Also disturbing was the process itself, how it all went down. And joining me now to discuss this and where we go from here is Brent Kylan. He's the Vice President for Strategic Initiatives here at the Family Research Council and FRC Action. Brent, welcome back to Washington Watch. Always great to have you. Appreciate it, Judy. All right. So um, your reaction today to the platform that was adopted? Well, like you said, um, there's the product, but there's also the process. And, you know, what I saw about the process today, definitely um, some, some concerning things there, you know, just to just to say it. Um, you know, I was there in uh, 2016 in Cleveland, got to watch the process play out there. Just very, very different. Of course, we had COVID 2020, so they just readopted what was adopted in 2016. But this year versus eight years ago, um, just, just as a comparison, what typically historically happened happens is, you know, each state gets their two platform delegates. So you have that. Typically, the process plays out over two days, Monday, Tuesday, and uh, Sunday night when they check in, when they get their credentials, all of that. They're given that that platform to look at to see, uh, okay, how do I feel about this? Do I feel like it needs to be amended? Because no, you, you know, Jody, as a legislator, you need time to, to process something that you are right. voting on. This year, um, much of that just simply did not happen. Uh, delegates were not given a, a platform until literally while, while they were sitting there uh, this morning. So they didn't get it before, didn't have a chance to read it beforehand. And then that process that typically plays out over two days was half a day. And so you were asking delegates. So to, it was all over. Yeah. Half a day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and no, typically there are five or six subcommittees so they can really say, OK, let's let's analyze this. Let's have some discussion just to make sure there's nothing being left out. Make sure we as a national party, you know, are really good with this. Uh, no subcommittees at all. There was no subcommittee. Um, in fact, you know, being a, being a guest uh, in there today, there were delegates going to the mic and saying, hey, I actually thought I was going to be part of a subcommittee process first. Like, what what's going on there? And so um, it happened extremely fast. Wow. Um, and so just th those parts of the process, the process matters too. And the thing about that also is precedent. And I'm like, you know, openness and transparency as a precedent is just so important. Yeah, you know, I think, uh, I, I know uh, while my time in Congress, one of the things that aggravated my constituents and I think Republican voters all across the country, as much as anything else, was when we would get a 1,500 piece of work, a page piece of legislation two or three hours before we're voting on it, where none of us had time to read of it. We didn't know what was in it. And we always gripe about Nancy Pelosi's famous comment to pass it and then find out what's in it. But we do the same thing. It sounds very much like that's what took place even today in the platform. Yeah, I mean, the, the delegates were given the the platform to look at while they're trying to read it. Um, there's also discussion going on. So it's not even like a quiet room. And then they immediately had to vote on it after, wow. I, I don't know if it was an hour or whatnot. I didn't, um, uh, didn't have that. They were asked, we were all asked to check our phones and things like that. And so it's just, you, you want to make sure they have a chance to analyze uh, these delegates, many of them traveled. I mean, you've got all 50 states right. plus, That's a whole nother point. you know, yeah. um, it, they they spent a lot of time, energy to get here, and they need to make sure they're comfortable with what they're asked to be, to, to vote on. And I think, you know, Tony was talking about this, but there really is kind of a, I think, a short-term and a long-term approach you have to factor in when it's the platform. Yeah, the short term, the election, we get that, you know, that that's a factor here, but also the fact that this is the long term precedent. Um, I was talking to a Republican official today who was talking about this at the state level, and they said, we we adopted this new platform at the state level, and then our state legislators came up to us and started saying, we're introducing bills because this is what's in our platform now. And so that long term precedent is just so important, and you, you just Great can't, point. you can't, lose that aspect of it. No, that's a that's a really great point. And the the impact of a platform, Tony was talking about in the previous segment, has 
a tremendous impact on the legislators, obviously. Some 80 plus percent of the time they vote in accordance with the platform. But it also has an enormous impact on the voters. Uh, voters really do look at the platforms and they compare parties largely mm -hmm. on this. So, you know, when you look at the the voters out there, do, do you see any, do you have a thermometer to kind of gauge what kind of impact this might have on the voters where they feel like things that we've been fighting for for decades all of a sudden removed? It's going to be interesting to see that um, there, because there, there's still some good stuff in there, no denying that. There's also stuff that's been in there for about 50 years that isn't there anymore. To me, the other piece of the equation is, you know, the Democrat Party will adopt theirs next month, and it will be really interesting to see what that contrast is. There probably will be a stark contrast, but some of those issues, um, you know, polling done back in 2016, for example, 59% of Trump voters said that the party's strong positions on life and religious liberty had an impact on their vote. And so it really does make that difference. So it's just going to be interesting to see how people respond yeah, to that. Yeah, that's, uh, I couldn't remember the exact numbers, but I know that there's, there's polling that's been done that would indicate two-thirds plus of Republicans say that these specific issues do have a major mm -hmm. uh, impact yes. on how they're going to vote. And now I, I join you in wondering what kind of impact is this going to have as we come into uh, November, and I guess it's all up, up for grabs to see uh, when, when it all gets there. Well, Brent, I want to thank you for uh, being here, for being a part of the platform discussion. This is a, a, a disturbing day, not only for what is not in the platform, but the whole process why this came came about. And I'm still scratching my head as to how it went down like that. Any final thoughts as we wrap up here? Yeah, you know, I'm kind of doing the same thing, Jody. So it, it moved really, really fast. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll see uh, we'll see kind of what plays out in the days ahead for sure. All right, Brent Kylan, thank you so much for joining Appreciate us. Appreciate Jody, thank you. See you.